The title for my lesson this morning is Extra Extra. When you go through trials, don't forget to have joy. Now, me and my wife, we had the great opportunity to go to a show in the great town of Davis. And there was a, a, a big theater production of Disney's Newsies. Now, I like Newsies. I like Newsies because I like singing. Almost the, whole, almost the whole show is singing. I really like singing. And it's a feel-good story. There's the weaker person. The, the, the stronger person takes care of them. They overcome. It's wonderful. But here is something that happens a lot in the show. You get a bunch of little people, children mostly, running around the town of New York talking about selling papes. And there's papes, and there's papes to be sold, and it's, it's, a, it's a real interesting situation that the, the tyrant of the newspaper is holding these little guys down. Uh, it's a great story. I encourage you to see it. But they'd go around the town saying things like, extra, extra, illegal aliens take all the jobs and are pushed out of town. Ooh, that sounds like an interesting news story. Breaking news, breaking news, water rights disputes heat up and droughts, uh, during drought conditions. That sounds like a familiar topic. Extra, extra, scandal in the government as foreign official gives away sister. This just in, dad tried the same thing. Well, that's an interesting title. Maybe the next one. New Peace Treaty in the Middle East. Ah, another interesting title. Seems like we've heard that one before. Here's a great one. Son marries wrong girls, parents distraught. Now, some, some of you may be asking, Brother Diaz, where did you pull out these topics? These are kind of inflammatory. They're things that are kind of true today. And I'll tell you why these subjects and topics sound familiar because they're from the Bible. Even though they sound exactly like they could come from today's news, the Bible tells a story that isn't just history. It's not about what did happen, it's about what always happens. So let's talk about this for a minute. What's this have to do? Oh, of course, of course, I don't want to forget to give my newsies their credit. Remember, headlines don't sell papes. Newsies sell papes. It's always important to have someone out there proclaiming the message. Here's what I know about today, brothers and sisters. Times are hard. Times are hard. But I'm not here to talk about hard times. I'm here to proclaim good news, just as Jesus did when he came. Now, in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it states, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Good words from a good man in that. Now, knowing that there are going to be trials, and that we should have joy with those trials, today I want to talk about some Old Testament stories. Never forgetting 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where it says, all scripture, some of it, no, all of it, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, I would tell you, brothers and sisters, that there's a lot of good work to be done. And there's only one place that's selling the supplies for it. Not Sportsman's Warehouse, it's not Cabela's, it's not G.I. Joe's. It's the Bible. The Bible's got what we need for the trials and the testings that we need to endure. So let's go ahead, join with me in Genesis chapter 26, as we put on the whole armor of God and get ready for trials. Now, as we read, all scripture is good for uh, reproof and doctrine, and it's important that we read it as such. So, people might ask me, Brother Ken, what's Genesis chapter 26 got to do with me? Well, as we read through some of this, keep in mind some of the headlines we talked about earlier. Genesis chapter 26, 1 through 6. Now, there was a famine in the land. 
besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Now it's important here to note that the name of Abimelech, even though that sounds very familiar because it is mentioned before in Genesis chapter 20, that is actually what the Gerarians call their king. It's not the guy's actual name. So this is likely a different king than it was during the time of Abraham. Verse 2, And the Lord appeared to him, the him is Isaac, and said, Do not go down to Egypt, dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and will bless you. For you uh, and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens, and will give to your offspring uh, all these lands, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham, because your dad, obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac settled in Gerar. Some could say that was definitely a good choice by Isaac, listening to God. One can say that his father didn't always do that. Even though he was a man of great faith, who God made a promise to, Abraham had some issues. That happens in families. Sometimes fathers have issues. Sometimes those issues get passed on to the son. We as fathers have a, have a very unique job. Our job is to equip our children and grow them straight and narrow in ways that we want to see them grow, so that they can go on and survive and do uh, all the good things that God has set aside for them. But oftentimes, our stories of conquest, uh, our stories of, what was the word in the class this morning uh, that, that they used for if you were uh, carousing? Our stories of carousing get in the way of our children's growth, because they want to be like us. They want to be like us, and sometimes we don't always give them the best examples. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Let's define a couple words that we just read. Famine. Famine in the Old Testament uh, depicts a time uh, often that there's drought, that there is things like what we would consider a depression, things like crazy inflation. What was easy at one point in time, during a famine, has now become really hard. There isn't resources, there isn't money, there isn't water, there isn't ways to sell things, there isn't ways to buy things. Famine in the Old Testament reminds me a lot of recession, depression times here in our great country, where things become, that used to be easy, become very hard. This is where we join uh, Isaac, uh, as he's settling and listening to God's word, he's in time of famine. Now, the word famine is used 101 times in the Bible. At one time, it's even used uh, as a time where they describe a famine in the land for hearing God's word. A famine in the land for hearing God's word. Meaning that there's a shortage of it. Not only is there a shortage, but people don't want to hear it. That's found in Amos. We can talk more about that. Another weird word that's in this group is the word sojourn. Now this means to be a visitor in the land. Not really a resident, but kind of temporary. This isn't your final spot. This is a spot I want you for now. One of the wonderful parts about these first few verses is verse 5. God gives you how to stay in his blessings. During a time of famine, if someone says, Hey, I got a way for you not to have to be hurt by the famine. All you got to do is eat six. That's good information to have. And God gives Isaac that information. And Isaac does a very important thing that his father did not do. He listened, he followed it, and he stayed in place the first time. As we move through Genesis chapter 26, we come to verses 7 through 11. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, that's Isaac, he said, eh, 
She's my sister. Okay, uh, ladies in, in the audience here, just go ahead and look at your, your, your uh, husbands and tell them thank you. Because I would seriously doubt any of you would still be sitting here if your husband tried to give you away as their sister. I think that would be a bad thing. So just so you guys know, you guys are doing a great job. This guy, <laughs> this guy here, Isaac, maybe not so much. She's my sister, for he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. Must be a thing for these guys through the line of Jacob. Jacob's wife was near 90 years old when he tried to give her away as a sister, fearing her beauty would get them, uh, surely get him killed. And here Isaac is trying to give his wife away too. Huh. Now, when he had been there a long time, not sure how long that is, but it's been a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. Could you imagine? I just gave my wife away as my sister, but I'm going to kind of chill out in the king's castle. Um, and we're still going to converse at the, at the uh, water well. I couldn't imagine anyone not knowing me and Mandy were married if we were in the same place. It just kind of goes. We have a synergy, a, a way of doing things, and a silliness about us that would become very evident. Much like it became evident for Abimelech. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Could have thought lest I die because of her? Now in Genesis uh, chapter 20, 1 through 18, it tells a similar story about Abraham and his wife Sarah. Uh, and it's, it's funny that it was also with an Abimelech, right? another king of, of Gerar. Now I could imagine that kingships, they're passed on in families, the first Abimelech probably talked to the second one and says, if there's ever a man of God that comes through and he's got a wife, don't touch her. <laughs> Period. We know that that had to be passed along because in the very next verse, uh, it says, uh, I'm sorry, in that same verse it says, because I thought less, oh, I'm sorry, verse 10, Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife and you would have brought... Uh, guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Wow. Surely be put to death. Even touching them. Because he knew. He had heard the stories, I'm sure, from Genesis 20, where God said, I'm going to kill you and all your people if you even so much as lay a finger on Sarah. Well, that story came right forward through Isaac, Jacob's son. This just goes to show that even though being like your dad sometimes can be a good thing, like father, like son, it's not always the best thing. But I have great news. I have great news. Just like the Lord was, was with Abraham and Isaac, the Lord is patient with us and keeps his promises. Now I use the word patient. I don't use the word that sounds a lot like patience, tolerance. The Lord is not tolerant. He states that in several places. But what He is, is patient. He is patient enough to give you time to fix it. And during that time He's waiting, it doesn't mean He stops blessing you. We read in, right there at the end of uh, verse 11 that Isaac had done the wrong thing. But we pick right back up in verse 12, and it says... And Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. There wasn't like 20 years later. There wasn't like until he repented and made 300 burnt sacrifices. There wasn't a bunch of other stuff. The Lord made a promise and he's going to keep it. He's going to be patient while you figure yourself out. But he's not going to be tolerant if you don't. Okay? He shows us this over and over again in the Bible as a steady theme on how he deals with his people. The interesting thing here, and I've heard this preached a lot of different ways, so I had to go look it up myself. And Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold the Lord blessed him. 
I've heard some people say a hundred times, he had one sheep and now he's got a hundred. I've heard it say he had ten bushels of wheat, he planted it, and now he has ten thousand bushels of wheat. That's not what the Bible says. That would be a blessing, yes. But would it really be contingent on the Lord's blessing? Would it make sense, the next verses, if that's all the more he gained this year? And the man became rich and gained more, the man being Isaac, gained more until he became very wealthy. Not only rich, very wealthy. So wealthy, he had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. The Lord didn't say, here's a lot to get you by. You'll be comfortable. That's not what he said. He didn't say this to one man. That's not what he said. He said he blessed them a hundredfold. How many, how many mathematicians do I have out there? Any mathematicians? People who like math? I like math. Math's pretty cool. A hundredfold is like taking, I have one, now I add one. That's one fold. Right? Not like uh, this paper here. I have one. If you gain one fold, guess how many you have? Two. If you gain three folds, how many do you have now? Four. If you add four folds, how many do you have? Eight. If you fold again, how many do you have? Sixteen. God didn't bless him a hundred times. That's not what he blessed. He blessed a hundredfold. That's an enormous number. It's so much that the king of the land envied him. Would the king have envied him if it was just ten times as much? No, he's got a whole kingdom. What's he care? It was a hundredfold. It was so much that he envied him. This is important. It's an important concept to understand that in one year, God blessed him so much that a whole other country envied his wealth. Do you think it was easy for that king to see where it came from? I think it was. 14, it says he had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. And in 15, it states, now the Philistines had stopped uh, and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. Isn't this the world we live in? I mean, we come here as Christians, we're in a place where they scoff us, they make fun of us, they say that the Bible isn't real, they say that our morals are too high, things are, are the way they say it should be, and they're willing to cancel our businesses, and cancel our subscriptions, they're willing to uh, take away our land, shut our buildings, to say, hey, we're right. Here in the Old Testament, they stomped out wells. What's more important in the Old Testament? The water. They took away their water. They were so mad and jealous, they took away their water. They canceled his ability to make flocks. They canceled his ability to make life. Which takes me to our next topic. Sometimes, we have to fight for our rights. In Genesis chapter 26, we read, Now the Philistines had stopped and, and filled the earth, all the wells, all his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. So what's, what happens next is Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, get out of here, uh, for you are much mightier than we. In one year's time, Isaac has gone from Boy, I wonder where me and my wife should live, and I'm going to give away my wife as my sister, because I don't want to die, to becoming so mighty that he's larger than the whole kingdom that surrounds him. So much so that they say, you got to go. We, we can't have all this competition. you got to go. So Isaac departed from, uh, from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped uh, after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given him. All right? I can't survive over here. I'm going to move just a little ways farther, where my dad was. 
I'm going to pick up where he left off. We're going to redig his wells, and we're going to settle here. Now that would have been cool. That would have been a good idea. But, in verse 19 it says, But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. Oh, move into another country and... Nope, you can't have the blessing. There's the people that live here, that's our, that's our water. You can't be here. So what did Isaac do? He turned the other cheek. That was mighty nice of him. Uh, but before doing so, uh, he called the name of the well Essek, because they quarreled with him. Essek, this is the, the quarrelsome well. You can have your quarrelsome water. As he continued on, Uh, as he continued on, uh, they dug another well. And they quarreled over that also. Here they come again. These herdsmen, you just can't get rid of them. They said, oh, no, 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 that's our water too. You can't have that, that's our water. And when he did so, he called its name Sitna. Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Finally. It's a lot of work to dig a well. It's not like they just took a, a shovel and started digging in the ground. But we're talking feet. Sometimes uh, in the valley that they're talking about, some wells are as deep as 200 feet. This was not small jobs. And when we say they dug a well, it's not like they dig it now where they take a post or a, a pipe and, and drive it through. No, they dug the well. <laughs> a lot of dirt had to be moved to make this well work. A lot of things had to be cleaned, shored up. Things had to be done to make these well work. Those things were taken away from him. The works of his servant and his house were taken away from him. As soon as he was successful, you can't have it. But God made a place for him. He called it Rehoboth. The names of these wells are always kind of curious to me. How do you pick these names? Now, we all know that Isaac means giggles, laughter. So I have to think that Isaac had a little bit of a sense of humor. Just a little one. Just a little bit. Kind of shows through a little bit the dryness of his sense of humor in the names of these wells. The first one he called Quarrelsome because they were being Quarrelsome. The second one he called Sitna. Any guesses of what Sitna stands for? Well, it comes from the same root word as Satan. <laughs> you, okay, you want the fighting water? You can have the fighting water. Oh, you want the second well? <laughs> Joke's on you. You can have the well of the devil. There you go. That's the devil water. You can have that. That's Satan's water. Enjoy that. I think it might have been a little bit of a back slap there, especially since it's recorded for all time. The final name of the well he named Rehoboth, which means a broad place or to make wine. And that's exactly what he's going to do there. He's going to settle down and make his camp. He's going to make a place for his herdsmen, a place where his uh, blessings from God can be replenished, replaced, and continue to grow. Isaac definitely had a sense of humor even in his trials. And that's what's important for us to remember, is that we can have, we can have joy when we're going through troubles. A lot of times we look at these news stories and these things going on in the world and it brings us down. It brings us down hard. Our job as children of God isn't just to be mocked by people. That's not the way the Bible does it. When you talk about God and when he looks at the crazy things people are doing, God does the mocking. All that wisdom of man is silliness for God. We can be the same way. We don't have to be serious and subdued. It's important that we recognize a few concepts from the Bible. Whenever we encounter God, it's important that we bow. That we come under his supervision. That we do the things he says a lot like it talked about in uh, verse 5 of chapter 26. 
here are the things you need to do. I bow down to you. I will do the things. I will keep your commandments. I will do the things you need me to do. But when it comes to the world, we're not to bow down. We don't worship the world. We're to stand up. Stand up for God. Make sure that God doesn't get trampled in the world. Follow his rules. Follow his commandments. Do the things that are right in his sight. Now next week we're going to wrap up the rest of Genesis 26. Talk about a few more of those, those uh, headlines inside of the paper that we talked about first. We're going to cover things like peace in the Middle East. Okay? Uh, and how our lives witness one to another. How children's choices... Hey, children, this is to you. How children's choices make us parents feel. We have feelings, too. They're important to be aware of. As well as the meaning of some other wells that Isaac dug. In closing, we want to preach and teach God's Word. Like I said in Genesis chapter uh, 26, verse 5, Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. This is why God blesses us. Because we keep His charge, keep His commandments, His statutes, and His law. What's the law? The law of peace. The law of love. Jesus broke the old law. Usher in the new church. We read in 2 Timothy 4, 1-5, through 5, I charge you in the presence of God, and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. What's he charged us to do? Preach the word. Okay. Be ready in season and out of season. There are different seasons. Okay. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience. Not intolerance. Patience and tolerance are not the same thing. Patience and tolerance aren't the same thing. You don't have to tolerate people's silliness, but you do need to be patient with them. And teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. How about some of the cunning fables people come up with? Look at TikTok for a while. As for you, as for you, this is you, brothers and sisters, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of the evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Preach the word, says Paul in this charge to Timothy. Hugh Thompson Kerr put the emphasis correctly. We are not to preach sociology, but salvation. Not economics, but evangelism. Not reform, but redemption. Not culture, but conversation. Not progress, but pardon. Not a new social order, but a new birth. Not revolution, but regeneration. Not renovation, but revival. Not succession, but resurrection. Not a new organization, but a new creation. Not democracy, but the gospel. Not civilization, but Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. Not diplomats for Him. There's a song out there. I love it very much. It's by Keith and Christy Getty. It's called In Christ Alone. The words of this song are very powerful. Listen, listen to them here. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he was sent to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ. 
I live. There in the ground, his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. Christ's life is summed up beautifully in these lyrics. We remember his humility in coming down to earth, his love when he died on the cross for us, and his victorious resurrection. Changing, our changing or disbelieving any part of these truths nullifies all of them. We can move forward in confidence, faith, knowing our Savior lives. We have gained a victory through Him. The way we truly gain that is through baptism. I know there's a creek nearby. There's probably some canals. Someone's got a hot tub or a pool. But if there's anyone here that needs baptism, needs to get in touch with the one that blesses you, not ten times, not a hundred times, but a hundredfold, baptism is the way you get to that. Receiving the Holy Spirit is what guides you. God is patient. That means, guess what? Just like Isaac, just like Abraham, just like a lot of people we read about in the Old Testament, you're going to mess up. God is not tolerant of that, but He's patient that you're going to make it right. And it's that patience that saves all of us and has given us a way to live. So if anyone has a need, please come forward.